Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. Today, I'm super excited to be chatting with Dr. Quinn Hannock. Quinn has a doctorate of physical therapy from the University of Indianapolis, and he is the head of sports re- rehabilitation at Juggernaut. Quinn is also the founder of Clinical Athlete. Thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So before we get into some mobility myth-busting stuff, can you just give us a bit of background on how you got into all this stuff? I think you played Div 1 uh, football, if I'm not mistaken. You played some corner. So can you just give us a, a little bit of an intro to you and how you got into this space? Yeah, sure. So currently, I'm a physical therapist. I began my undergraduate studies as an exercise science major at, uh, in a, at a small school in, in Indiana. And I, I played football there for a few years and uh, was going to be a, a strength and conditioning coach and, and was, wanted to go the university route until I kind of figured out that the hours are crazy and it just wasn't quite the dynamic that I wanted. And so I went private sector and worked as a, as a strength and conditioning coach for a few different facilities and decided to go back to physical therapy school as a way to just Breath, you know, increase my breadth of knowledge and graduated from the University of Indianapolis in 2013, but kind of at the start of my PT career after I stopped playing football, started a career uh, in competitive weightlifting. So just blending kind of the realms of, of performance and, and rehab and uh, just been kind of trying to do that ever since. And uh, my office is inside of a weightlifting gym and and so it's perfect. You know, most of my clientele, I'd say 99% of them are what I would define as an athlete being that their goals, like they come into my office and their goals are to get back to some type of athletic endeavor, whether or not they're any good at that at endeavor <laughs> is another story. You know, if that's your definition of athlete, depending on, you know, their prowess. But uh, so it's, it's perfect and very, very fun atmosphere and, and uh, I'm right where I want to be. That's great, man. So did you personally have an injury or something that kind of set you back and then set you down on the path of, of physical therapy or, or was that just something that you were interested in either way? Yeah. You know, well, everybody's got their injuries, you know, and I plan 12 years of American football. will we'll do that to you. I, it wasn't one of those moments that like, Oh, I got hurt. And then I, I got physical therapy and it was like, I want to do that. It wasn't really that at all. Um, in fact, I didn't even, I had gotten physical therapy before as a, as an athlete, but didn't really think twice about it. It was like after I graduated and started working as a strength and conditioning coach, I just felt like I had a knowledge gap in regards to managing injuries. And then I started to do some research and it was like, Oh, duh, you know, physical therapy. Why didn't I look into this before? So it was more to, to increase my, you know, just, just a buffet of, of knowledge, I guess. So I could better serve my athletes Gotcha, man. So moving into some uh, mobility myth busting stuff, foam rolling is super popular nowadays. And we often hear kind of fancy phrases like breaking up adhesions or scar tissue and restoring sliding surfaces. Can you tell us what's really going on when we hop on a foam roller? So if I'm going to answer your question directly, no, because nobody knows what's directly going on. I can tell you what is probably not going on. It's a more of a jumping off point, I think, to get the conversation going. Yeah. And, you know, what I'm about to say is based on my interpretation of the current scientific literature, the narratives of breaking up your adhesions, uh, releasing scar tissue, whatever you want, all that stuff, you know, restoring sliding surfaces – there is no evidence to my knowledge that any of that is validated. Uh, so, and, and we'll kind of take a step down and just talk about like common sense. If you could just lay on a foam roller and rearrange your tissues that easily as if we were made of clay, imagine what the barbell would do to you. You know, a 300 pound barbell on your back would just obliterate you. You would have permanent at minimum you would have permanent dents in your upper traps like you would never have an upper (laughs) trap trigger point all you have to do is back squat right totally so but but no that doesn't count it's when you lay on a foam roller somehow there's this magical difference between a foam roller so from a plausibility standpoint it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and uh, on another point in that is how can you selectively target the tissues that you want to quote break up and then somehow save the good stuff like muscles and why aren't the muscles being rearranged and torn, you know, but somehow scar tissue and connective tissue, which are inherently stronger, somehow do. And, and so, again, the plausibility of that stuff is 
is called into question and there's no evidence to back that up. Now, there is plenty of research on foam rolling. And currently what we seem to know, or at least what it, what it seems to suggest, is that a bout of foam rolling can increase range of motion in the short term. Very similar to static stretching in that regard, in that your perception of tightness or whatever, however you want to define that is changed. So another mechanism is, is it changes your sensory input. And sometimes I'll measure that as like pain pressure threshold, meaning they'll, they'll like poke the people and measure the force. And then they'll have the people rate the discomfort level of whatever they poked them with. And then they'll foam roll and then they'll poke them again. They'll say, oh yeah, that doesn't feel as bad. And so that makes total sense though. If you think about it, we do that all the time. Imagine if you stub your toe, what are you going to do? You hop up and down, you shake it, you rub it. What if you bang your knee against the table, you rub it, you're like, ah, shit. You know, you jam your <laughs> finger, you shake it in the air. So what, and then in those instances, what you're doing is just creating a stronger sensory input to try to override the pain perception. And that's pretty much what foam rolling does is it's that overriding signal. It's that, it's that strong sensory input in the short term. So that is a thing. There's something happening there, but that's, that's far away from the structural narratives that are commonly touted as the mechanism with that. So in implementation, currently I don't really prescribe it because I just, there's also data that you can just do more of the movement, like your warm up could be, could give you the same sensory change. Like, for example, you come into the gym and you do that first squat, like that first air squat, and you're like, oh, God, this feels terrible. And so you've got choices, right? A lot of people will panic. I'm like, oh, I need a warm up for my warm up. And that's where they'll go and, and, you know, hit the foam roller for 20 minutes or something like that. But what you could also do is just do more of the movement. So, like, yeah, that first squat, that first overhead press always feels like crap. Do more of it. And then over time, in the time that it would have taken you to foam roll, in that same amount of time, you will warm up to the movement just like you would have anyway. And the benefit of that is that you get extra practice with skill. So if you want to meet in the middle, generally what, how I prescribe it, I'm always like, people are like, well, what about foam rolling? I say, you know what, if you want to do it, that's fine. Uh, if you're going to do it, I would recommend short bouts. So like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, if just enough to change your perception and then interspersed within the movement. So 10, 15 seconds of whatever you want, say you're squatting, you want to foam roll your glutes, your hip flexors or whatever, and then you hit the empty bar. Do a bunch of empty bar sets, tempos, pauses, and then go back to the roller, 10, 15 seconds, and then you know whatever your first warm-up set is, 40 kilos, 50, 60, do that back and forth, maybe three or four rounds. And that saves you a lot of time as opposed to compartmentalizing things where you're like 20 minutes of foam rolling and then you still got to warm up. Like you still any, like however you spin it, you still have to go to the movement and orient yourself to the movement. So you might as well just start integrating those things a little bit more closely. Um, and the follow up questions are, okay, that makes sense. But what about the foam roller that vibrates? Or what about the foam roller with knobs on it? Is that any different? Or the foam roller with lights? Or the ball? It's really hard and it must do something different. Or the, the $600 gun that's just like a jigsaw and it just pop, 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 pop. <laughs> it's, all, it's all in the same bucket. So in big picture, all you're doing is you're changing your sensory input, your perception in the short term. If that is, a, if that is worth it for you, then you know, do you. But minimum effective dose is what I would recommend. I'll that totally there. that totally makes sense, man, and, and a brilliant breakdown. And I mean, whether you hop on a foam roller or not, that first set of squats, air squats or whatever, is going to be snap, crackle, pop. It's going to feel like shit. So, totally. yeah, I mean, you either do it before the foam rolling or like either way, you got to get there. So I like yeah. that advice. Yeah, now, yeah. Now, I will say, too, after. So I think I think longer bouts of that stuff would probably be better served for after training or uh, like on rest days, but not necessarily for the reasons that people think. Not, not necessarily for the direct local contact or what the, you know, the tissues in question. It's more of a, 
a ritual. So like when we are done training, it's probably time to start winding down our mind, our system. Like we need to kind of get back into food mode, you know, and if people want to say shift back into parasympathetic state, that's, that's fine. We just can't, it's hard to measure that stuff. And I don't really know what that means to some extent, but like I get it, but that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like after training, whatever your routine is to chill out, like mine is to just, is to just sit and ch- and ch- literally chill, like slow my breathing down. Some people like to lay on their backs with their feet up on the wall and like that 90, 90 breathing position and take nice deep breaths for five or 10 minutes after training. And some people like to foam roll, but I think it's just the ritual of like winding down your like slow movements. It just kind of, it feels nice. You're emptying your mind. I think on rest days, a very similar concept. The people will say, well, it's increasing blood flow. I think a better way to increase blood flow is probably movement, like getting on an an exercise bike or a very slow cadence. That's going to systemically create way more blood flow throughout the tissues than superficially foam rolling. Uh, But again, it's the same with like static stretching. If you like to stretch right before you go to bed because it just relaxes you and you and you prefer that, like the other option is just take a warm bath. I like to stretch for a while. Like that's cool. Uh, but I think that's where the benefit is and not the, not the local tissue in question, it's kind of a different lens. Perfect, man. And you kind of touched on this, but some folks steer people away from static stretching before lifting or an explosive, explosive activity because, I don't know, it may decrease power output. What does the science say around static stretching performance and all that stuff? Yeah, it's a good question. There definitely is, it was like early 2000s where there was research coming out where they were showing that static stretching can decrease your power output. But you always got to look at like the study design. So what they would have the people do is they would static stretch for like 30, 60 seconds, their quads, their their calves and their hamstrings, stuff like that. And then they would go onto a force plate and they would do a max effort vertical jump directly after the static stretching bout. And they would measure like small but significant changes in your top end power, like, you know, 3% decrease or something like that. So, I mean, potentially significant depending on on who you are. And so dynamic and then dynamic stretching does not do that. It doesn't create decreases in power. Neither does foam rolling, by the way. Um, So if you're going to pick one or the other, foam rolling is probably the better option. It doesn't seem to consistently decrease power output the same way that static stretching does. So then the the whole thing was like avoid static stretching like the plague. Although it does increase range of motion in the short term, you have that kind of like shift down. I don't know. We don't know the mechanism. Maybe it's some type of you lose the elastic quality in the short term. It doesn't last forever. It's like an hour and you're back to being the normal you. But more current research has shown that if you do a dynamic routine after the bout of static stretching, then the power output that you lost is not is is no longer there so it it actually like repotentiates the system which is kind of how we warm up anyway even like let's say sprinters they'll do like a little static stretching but then they do like 10 15 minutes of of acceleration drills like they you know they do lots of drills and i think that probably mitigates any potential power loss for weightlifters you might static stretch, but then you're going to do an empty bar routine and you're going to start moving. You're not going to get to your top weights until, you know, 15, 20 minutes down the line. So I actually don't think that it's that much of a concern unless you literally are going to stretch and then go right to your max effort movement. Just don't do that right. and you're good. But that's just not how most people, that's not, you know, that's not typical routine anyway. Um, but, you know, if it's like if, if dynamic stretching or dynamic movement is doing more of the movement, like walking lunges, um, a skips or whatever it is, if, if that gives you the same short term range of motion changes and like warms things up, I don't see a, a, a place necessarily for static stretching as a as a big priority. That totally makes sense. Now, do we know what's actually happening when somebody becomes more flexible or more mobile? Like, is it the tissue changing? Is it a message from the brain letting the body know that that range of motion or increased range of motion is safe? Do we know what's going on there? No. And I think the word tone. So I've been trying, I I want to figure this out because I think it would explain a lot of stuff and it would help us probably 
uh, design our studies a little bit better because we know, like, understand mechanisms. But I, I, we, I don't think we do, and I haven't seen anything definitively. I think it's probably a combination. I'm much more of in the camp that there's percept that that the nervous system just kind of like allows things to happen when you've greased the groove and you've prepared things a little bit. Like we know that blood flow is a thing when you move your joints around the synovial fluid, all of that just kind of washes around the joint. And so literally lubricate stuff like a warm up's important to just move, uh, nerve conduction velocity improves. So like the timing of your firing patterns, that, that potentiation effect is, is a little bit better. So like people are always like, well, cheetahs don't warm up. They're kind of like, they're prepared not to warm up. You know, like I, th- I think if we did train, to just walk into the gym cold and then go into our max effort thing, we would get good at that. Like we would, we would adapt to that, but that would take a while. And so the, the whole point of a warm up is to kind of charge the nervous system, prepare the nervous system for the activities, for the increasing intensity that that's about to happen. And so I, I definitely think it's a much more of a nervous system mediated thing. And if you think about it, like, let's say somebody's under anesthesia and a doctor could just move their limbs all over the place. Like they would just be a floppy neuter, like all the flexibility in the whole entire world. And then if they wake up, all of a sudden they've got hamstring tension, you know, and that's, so that's nervous system. That's not a structural thing. I've, I've had some colleagues tell me that some substances within the muscles could be a play too. There's a substance called Titan in the muscles. That's kind of like a a viscous thing. And so when you, if you stretch and move, it kind of changes the viscosity and that might play a role, but I don't think that's as powerful. And there's no data on that. There's just like pontificating in the hypotheses. But I I think that the role of the nervous system is so much more powerful. And I think it's about preparation and tolerance to things. And if you think about it, the more skilled you at, are at a movement, the less warm up you actually need generally over time. The newer a skill is or the newer a position is that you're trying to get, the more that you seem to kind of have to warm it up to grease that groove a little bit, but then your body learns. And I, I think the next the follow up question is always like, well, what about gymnasts and dancers and, and competitive cheerleaders, these types of athletes who, or martial artists? types of athletes who require crazy amounts of range of motion and then they seem to have it. I think one, there's probably a selection bias there. Like who's really going to stay in gymnastics? I I think there's a genetic component. Like some people are just more bendy than others, right? And who's going to stay in gymnastics if if like stretching hurts and is uncomfortable? You're not going to stay in gymnastics for 12, 15 years. So I think think that there's some selection bias there and like, you know, people who are naturally – gifted in those attributes tend to stay there because they're already good at it. But then also they're not just cranking passively into positions. Take gymnasts, for example. Yeah, they can do the splits on the ground, but they can also hold the splits in the air actively. So they have over the years, they have trained to be able to fire muscles and, and at those end ranges, which is a difficult thing. And so I, if we looked at their like muscle tendon unit, is it maybe a little different than somebody who doesn't train at those extreme ranges of motion? Like, yeah, probably. But I think that what trumps the, that is their nervous system is allowing it to happen. And they've trained that over the course of years. And that's what a lot of the static stretching literature would say is it increases your tolerance to stretch where they don't see changes in the muscle tendon junction necessarily, but they, they see changes in just, or they're, they're perceiving it as changes in tolerance to the position. And I think that's really what's at play. And then if you train that over and over, your body will tolerate greater ranges of motion. To, you know, and to the, and then the limit is your bony structure. At some point, bone's going to knock against bone and you can't push past that. But your connective tissue probably has some, some pretty large extensive capacity to extend and, and, you know, tr- be trained in those, in those things. If we're patient enough, that's, that's probably the big key. Right. Yeah. That stuff is super fascinating, especially with, you know, accessing ranges of motion. And then something, when you look at somebody like 
has an arthritic hip or whatever and just hasn't yeah. accessed any of those ranges of motion. So um, I guess it is, yeah, a piece, like you said, the nervous system needs to be okay with that um, and then, right. you know, access it in general, right, on a continuous basis. Yeah, arthritis is interesting because then now you are dealing with a structural component. But I, but I also think, and this is just anecdote and based on my experience because I've we've worked with a lot of people with arthritic joints who come in and it's like, wow, that – the hinge on the door is real rusty. And it's like, I don't think that that rust will come off, you know, but then it's like, it's crazy over time. They get a l- more range of motion, not everybody, but like they, even they have potential for change. And I think the body probably puts the e-brake on sooner than it needs to as a way to protect. But if you, continue to dose the stressor or the activity or whatever it is frequently enough, but with, you know, under threshold. So the body doesn't really freak out, then it'll start to let go a little bit. And to the potential that your structure allows, truly, you'll start to get closer to that. Um, and you know, within that, a lot of times sensitivity perception and pain perception will start to dwindle down too, as we, as those movements and positions become less threatening to the system. It yeah. takes a while though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I've I've seen that same thing. Somebody comes in and, you know, a body weight squat and they get like a quarter of the way down and then over time, you know, they're hitting parallel and then below. But it, it does it takes a lot of time. It's why it's so important to make sure that you're prioritizing the activity over some of those more passive means, like we've already discussed because those more passive means are not enough stimulus, ultimately, not enough stimulus to create change and we don't it's probably a combination of not enough uh like actual force through the tissues and they've done some three-dimensional models where it's like a crazy amount of force is needed to to like rearrange tissue it, uh, like too much for us to tolerate right our flesh would become obliterated <laughs> but it, and it's also probably not frequent enough so if you want to cast like if you cast somebody for six weeks they're going to develop a contracture, meaning their tissues are going to going to adaptively shorten, but that's 24 seven. And that takes weeks. So imagine the amount of frequency that you would need to create those types of changes passively. It's, it's more frequent than we can, that's, that's possible. And it's probably not enough load and stress to create that change. But what's cool about movement and loaded movement is that it is a lot more stress and the, re- the repetition creates frequency. And it's just a much more, and also the motor control aspect of things. I think if we, our bodies respond to things a little bit better when they're in movement patterns, because that's what we're wired to do. We're not really wired to be passively tugged and we're not clay going back to that whole thing. Like the nervous system is kind of the mediator of all this. So that's why it's, it's important to make the movement patterns your priority. What sucks about that is that that takes work and, and sometimes it's tedious and boring and sometimes slightly uncomfortable. So human nature is to take the easy road and to do the things that kind of feel good, you know, but that's six months down the line, we're spinning our wheels. Right, right. Now, when I first dug into some of your work, I really liked what you said around neutral spine being a range as opposed to a fixed position with varying degrees. Can you explain how neutral spine is a range and then tie that in with something like butt wink if possible? Yeah, definitely. Neutral spine, if we like from a textbook standpoint, we would think lower dotted curve at the cervical spine, the kyphosis actually of, of the thoracic spine, that's a normal curve of the upper back is, is kyphotic. And then a, a lordosis of the lower back. And if we're going to just take that as like baseline, but the problem is we don't have normative values. We don't know what's normal, right? Like uh, neutral spine, you know, exactly the amount of degrees of each curve we don't know that and we're so variable everybody's a little different and what's even more interesting is that the, they're showing in different movements that changes in those curvatures come naturally with certain patterns and they're unavoidable to some extent so for example the good morning the kettlebell swing and the back squat a researcher by the last name of mckean looked at the back squat And he showed that not only is a relative posterior pelvic tilt and lumbar uh, kyphosis, lumbar posterior uh, flexion, unavoidable in the bottom of a squat. It happens to some extent with everyone. Just unracking the bar, he he saw lumbar flexion to some extent. With the kettlebell swing, Dr. Stuart McGill himself, you know, 
very stringent on, on certain things in, in regards to position. McGill was the, was the researcher and the coach cueing people to keep their backs flat. And what they found was at the bottom of a kettlebell swing, upwards of 26 degrees of lumbar flexion at the bottom of a kettlebell swing. And then a researcher by the name of Andrew Vygotsky saw the same thing with a good morning. So the point is not to say that, you know, everybody now we're just lifting weights like a pooping dog and turtle backs are cool and all these things. But it's, it's to say there's probably a, a range is much more of a pendulum. And there, we all have probably some buffer within that. And it's, it's a natural coupled motion. Like if you look at sprinters, hip extension and an anterior pelvic tilt is a natural coupled motion. It happens together. It's not an isolation. We're always trying to isolate hip extension and movements like bird dogs and glute bridges, but that's not the way it works in actual human movement. If you look at the shoulder and the thoracic spine, if you want thoracic spine extension, you can just put your arms over your head. It's a coupled motion. Shoulder flexion, thoracic spine extension happen simultaneously. And it's the same with squatting. So hip flexion and some amount of posterior pelvic tilt in order to accommodate that flexed hip is a coupled motion. Now, the follow-up question, now butt wink, we can just define that as like the observable posterior pelvic tilt at the bottom of a squat. So the question is, well, how much is too much? You know, like wh- what's the cutoff point? When do, I, when do I intervene? And it's a tough question because it's almost contextual. Like it, it kind of depends on the individual. I, I spin things from a performance perspective before I do an injury mechanism perspective. And I think that if it's, to the extent that it's affecting your performance, like let's say a front squat, you're losing your back position so bad at the bottom that you're dumping the bar or you're getting crushed, you know, or it's like it's getting worse as you move, like you can see it increasing, then probably some type of, of intervention. But I don't think it has to be super complicated. Like sometimes those butt wink, observable butt winks go away when and during a goblet squat. Like somebody's air squat will look a certain way, and then you put a counterbalance in their hand, and all of a sudden they they can squat with a more neutral spine. So, and, and or like a heel lift. Sometimes weightlifting shoes really really help that. So I think giving people some training wheels, and then tempos, pauses, cut them off. If you're uncomfortable with the amount of posterior pelvic tilt that you see in the bottom of a squat, make them go super slow and cut their depth off just above that point. Over time you will see their control improve, just like our conversation earlier. You'll see that inflection point decrease. It'll get further and further down before they hit that point of, of decreasing performance um, and to, to, their, to their structural limit. So I, I, there's also like a hand test. You can literally put your hand on the lower back at the bottom of the squat. And if you feel, if your hand becomes concave, like their lower back is literally making your hand curve because it's so flexed. Maybe that's a little bit too much because they'll probably, it's not sustainable under heavier load. But if your hand is flat against the, the flatness of their lower back or even convex because their lumbar spine is lordotic, they're probably okay. So there's, it's very subjective, you know, how much is too much. I also think our eyes play tricks on us as coaches because we may see movement and then we freak out a little bit. But a lot of times, What's, what an athlete is doing is they're going from a hyperextended position at the top, let's say a squat, they're like hyperextended, and then their body just normalizes at the bottom. So they end up in more of a flat but still neutral position that we would be okay with if we saw a snapshot. But because we saw movement happen in real time, we kind of think it's a problem. But you gotta you got to see where it's actually ending and you might be like, oh, that's actually okay, strong position. So then you can just cue the athlete, well, why don't you just start there? You know, why don't you just keep your pelvis level the whole time? And that, that probably just takes care of it. That's a great distinction, man. I really like that. Now, back in the day before I was a trainer, I had a you know pretty decent squatting mechanics. And then I came across the the knees out cue from the Kelly Starrett crowd. And then I thought that I needed to drive my knees out like crazy. And then kind yeah. of as a result of that, I ended up developing some knee issues. So can you break down that knees out cue for us and then touch on what you're looking for in the squat and how you cue it? I was there too. I was there for a while and it didn't feel great on me either. Uh, the knee, if, I mean, if you think about the knee, I think we overcomplicate it. The knee is a hinge joint 
to the to a large extent. It just goes flex, extend, flex, extend, flex, extend. So if we can treat it like that, we're probably better off. I, I typically just cue allow the knee to act naturally over the middle of the foot, and that, and then I allow the athlete to to, to toe out to some degree to, to accommodate their hip structure. And so it's just, I mean, it becomes very simple. You know, you're you're fighting that valgus position, but you're just resisting it. You don't have to overcorrect by shoving your knees out. And in fact, what I see is that it's real easy to do that exaggerated knees out position in an air squat or for a video or for a really light weight. But when it gets heavy, that's not a normal, natural position to drive into the floor for a lot of people. And then what the body will naturally do is it'll swing the knees back in to, so that you can actually push down into the floor. But sometimes it swings them in and overcorrects. So it, it goes into valgus and you're like, ah, push them out more, push them out more. When really you could probably just start in the middle and end in the middle. So it's about as simple as that. I, I think that if people, if you're seeing knees diving in or like, especially like one, like one knee is like way in, it's, there's usually an inflection point of intensity. And I think that we overcomplicate it and we could simplify it by just saying it's simply too heavy for them to move the way that we want them to move. For, so, for example, an athlete's back squatting and you're just cueing, okay, knees just right over the middle of the foot. Just let them track naturally. They're like, oh, yeah, that feels really good. They work up to 60, 70, 80 percent of their one rep max. That feels great. They get up to 90 percent and then they start doing weird things like they look like a baby giraffe. Well, it's simply too much stress. It's simply too much load. Find that threshold and get their work just under that. And like everything else that we've talked about, that threshold will naturally improve over time. It's just, it's adaptation. They just need to get stronger, more control in that position. I think we dive into the minutia a little bit too quickly. And, and a lot of these things can just be like simple cues. Um, I, the mechanics of the knee, there's not a whole lot of rotation that happens at the knee. There's a little bit, a small amount like degrees, single degrees, but that's not necessarily something that we can consciously control uh, both as the athlete and as the coach. So I think if we treat the knee more like just a straight up hinge and then a lot, and then appropriately dose the stressor, it takes care of a lot of that stuff and we don't have to overcorrect. Pushing the knees way out puts kind of a weird little torquey thing at, at the knee. It's, it's not, it's not super conducive to just allowing it to, to flex and extend because our foot is fixed. Right. Yeah. And, and driving the knees out, it almost feels, it's just seems inefficient to go out too far. You're just creating like torque yeah. in, in the way that you don't want to create torque. But it's, it's interesting too, because we're so afraid of that valgus position that it's like, you know, knees out to the max and, and that's okay to overdo that but that a little bit of valgus is not okay it's it's really interesting well we overcorrect it's our natural it's our natural tendency to overcorrect it comes from the acl mechanism research where they, they show like a valgus knee can be a mechanism for acl tear but it's a little bit misconstrued most acl tears a vast majority of them happen when you're landing and your knee is almost completely straight like 30 degrees of flexion and less. And 30 degrees of knee flexion is not that much. And it, and it happens in an instant. In a squat, your ACL is slacked at the bottom of a squat. Your ACL does not tear. It's very, very, very rare for an ACL to tear at the bottom of a squat, even if you go into valgus because it's not tensioned. It, the, the athletes that I know have torn their ACLs in the bottom of a squat, as gruesome as it sounds, usually something tears first. And then the knee just explodes like their patella tendon tears at the bottom of the squat. And then there's nothing holding their knee yeah. together. And so all their other things tear as well. So it's a different conversation. The meniscus is another conversation, but even so, like you can, it's not natural for the meniscus to be exaggerated by pushing out. It's just that bend and straighten it. Similar conversation with stay on your heels we're so afraid of, of being on our toes and, and putting more stress on our knees that way. Then we over exaggerate the whole, like stay back, stay back, stay back. And now our athletes are falling on their butts because they're off balance or like keep your back flat. We don't lumbar flexion may be a mechanism of injury for the disc. So we hyper extend people and then they get like facet syndrome and their backs get sore from hyper extending. So if, if we can just meet in the middle on a lot of this stuff, I think 
that would probably lend itself more naturally to movement in general and would decrease all of the fear mongering that we throw to our athletes like, Oh, don't do that. You'll get hurt. Don't do this. You'll get hurt. It's like they're walking on eggshells. So we, you know, we don't want to make people fragile mentally by over cueing them for this stuff. So I, this lens doesn't necessarily change the way that I think, like I still don't want to see that knee going crazy in, but I would just say something simple like, Hey, I want you to just keep your knee right over the middle of your foot so that you can drive straight into the floor. You'll produce more power that way. And they're like, Oh, that makes sense. Cool. I want to be a better athlete and produce more force as opposed to, Hey, don't let your knees go in because you're going to tear your ACL that way. So push them way out. (laughs) And they're like, Oh shit. You know, don't want that to happen. Uh, so yeah, I think that's kind of where I am. You just keep it simple. The knee is a pretty simple joint. Let the joints that have the rotational capacity dictate things like the hip and then accommodate is it kind of a hand in hand conversation, but the toe out thing that is accommodating natural hip structure. If somebody can squat with their toes completely straightforward, they can do that because of the parents that they have because of their archetype and their hip structure. They have more shallow hip sockets or more oriented, anteriorly oriented hip sockets, different femoral neck angles. These types of things dictate toe angle much more than something that we're trying to box people in as optimal or suboptimal. So in, in regards to a squat, when we're trying to get into an extreme range of motion, the very bottom of the squat, we want to respect the natural hip anatomy. So I just kind of let people do the whole toe out thing to whatever feels best for them. I'm glad that you oh, mentioned that, that. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned that the, the toes out, like because some people I'm sure have heard, hey, your toe, your your feet have to be screwed on perfectly straight in order to squat yeah. properly, right? And then there's that the other thing that you touched on as far as people sitting so far back on their heels, they're afraid for their knee to track past their toe at all or track forward over their toe at all. But uh, assuming that everything or the person is under control, you. I'm assuming don't have an issue with people's knees tracking past their toe in a squat. I don't. And just think about life. I mean, try to keep your shin vertical going up and down stairs. <laughs> You're like, well, I mean, we're, really, what are, are we, are we, are we supposed to be training people to, to be resilient to stress and to be, and to be stronger, you know, then why are we so afraid of these things? Let, allowing your knee to come forward does put more stress on your knee, but stress is what we adapt to. That's the whole point. Like try to keep a vertical shin on the soccer field or the football field. You know, try to keep a neutral spine in these sporting events. It just doesn't happen. So it, within reason, and again, from a performance perspective, if I'm going to receive my snatch on my tippy toes, I'm probably going to lose a lift. So no, that's not optimal for performance. But a nice balanced foot, you know, midfoot pressure, where do you jump from? Where, where can I feel explosive? I mean, that's where we want to be. The knee coming over the, over the foot, we have ankles for a reason. If, if you're allowing your hips, knees, and ankles to hinge naturally, that distributes forces. So it's not just going to your knee. And in fact, if you sit way back on your heels and keep your shins vertical, that puts more stress on your lower back. So it's like pick your poison. We don't want people to put stress on their back. We don't want people to put stress on their knees. It's like we might as well not even train. The, the, knee, the toes out thing versus toes forward, I do understand the argument for – athletic positions. So let's say a linebacker or a defensive back in football or whatever, basketball player, having their feet straight ahead so that they can change directions equally. That does make some sense to me, but it's because you're only in a quarter squat. You're nowhere close to your end ranges of your hips. Your hip has plenty of capacity to be toes forward and to have your knees right in line. But if you're in the very bottom of a squat, you are purposely testing end ranges. And so you need to respect where that end range falls naturally. And for, I would say most, so more than 50%, it's not toes straight ahead. Those people just have that. It just comes, they've always been able to do that. Can you make a change? You know, can you increase tolerance to a more toes forward, which would put the hips into an internally rotated position? Yes. I think there's potential to create tolerance to any position. You just have to you just have to kind of weigh your pros and cons. Like, is it worth it for me to put effort into jamming myself into a position that's not comfortable? Um, and there's diminishing returns. Like if you tow way out, 
you're like almost 90 degrees out or something stupid like that. Yeah, you have a lot. It's not very stable. Like you have a lot of wiggle there. So in that respect, yeah, maybe bring your toes in a little bit and, and find a middle ground. But it, it kind of comes back to middle. Find the middle. Yeah, no, that that totally makes sense, man. And I think sort of the general gist that I'm getting from you is chase performance um, and, and chances are you're going to be in a pretty good position overall. And, you know, the truth lies somewhere in between. Yeah, and injuries can injuries confound things. Pain confounds things. The way to simplify that is preparation. All the data right now, that's like, what are the variables that we can manipulate to reduce injury risk? Can we reduce injury risk by reducing valgus? Maybe in the gym, but watch somebody on the playing field and they're going to go into valgus a thousand times. So it's like, okay, we can't, that's, that's a variable that we can't really control. Neutral spine, the same thing, you know, these weird positions in sport. What we can control is training load. And there is a, there's a ton of awesome data coming out to saying you can reduce injury risk by t- trying to minimize spikes in your training load or uh, spikes up. So like in the, a crazy increase in training load all of a sudden or a crazy decrease. Like, hey, I went on vacation for two months and I didn't do shit. Now I want to ju- make up for lost time and jump right back into training. Regardless of your movement quality, whatever that means, you're, redu- you're in- increasing your injury risk. So that's why people whose movement looks pristine in textbook, they can still get hurt if they're not prepared for the stressor that you're putting upon them. So, you know, coach movement in a controlled environment to optimize performance and then optimize injury risk reduction by appropriate program. You know, it's like, duh, but these, but it's lost. You know, we, we, we screw that up all the time. Love it, man. Now, Quinn, as we start to wrap up here, can you let folks know where they can find more of your work, your social handles, all that good stuff if they want to learn more about you? Yeah, for sure. I, I have a you odd name, Quinn Hennick. So you can just like search that name on, on Instagram and I'm, you'll probably, you know, I'm the first one up. DPT is my Instagram handle. I'm on, I have two Facebook pages. Just type in my name. One's my coaching page and one's my personal. They're pretty much both coaching pages. Uh, Twitter, do the same thing. And then uh, YouTube as well. My YouTube, I don't have any ads. It's just like my YouTube channel are the videos that I send to my athletes. And so they're just short, succinct, you know, just some type of reference to maybe an exercise that you see. And the clinical athlete social media, definitely more education driven. So clinical athlete on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, We'll have a new website very soon where we'll have like a news feed of just nothing but sports rehab and performance stuff. So you just scroll through all that stuff for free, just endless, endless content. So we're all over. Beautiful, man. I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thanks so much for taking the time to come on and uh, share all this awesome info with us. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, absolutely, Marcus. I, I appreciate you having me on. Awesome, guys. I'll catch you on the next episode.